to me about um, how the film captures her versus how you knew her. Well, it's certainly the same, Janice. Uh, I'm, I'm not aware of some of the things that were in here. It's been fascinating to me to see a lot of that. I guess um, the only thing that I wish were in there were the, how much she liked Edith Wharton. That <laughs> came out on one of my shows, and I can see how that would overweight part of the documentary. Uh, it just brought back so many memories. I first saw Janice at Fillmore. Anyone old enough to remember Fillmore here? <laughs> and I, <laughs> thank you, both of you. Uh, I, uh, a friend of mine took me there. I didn't know what I was getting in for. There were about four acts. And afterwards, I said, you know, the best one, I thought, was that girl in the green velvet pants, uh, Janice something. Odd that there could be a time in my life when I thought of her as Janice something. And he said, yeah, that's Janice Joplin. And I said, what? I don't know how I would describe her style. I heard of it. She's uh, an ecstatic. And I was very proud of myself for being able to think of the word ecstatic at that point. <laughs> but I would love to know what it felt like to be Janice in her highest, in the good sense, moments on stage at that peak level of exuberance. It must have been thrilling. So I remember asking her once in Sardis, and Janice entering Sardis in all her feathers and everything after a taping, uh, quieted the place instantly <laughs> for a moment. Um, she, uh, I, I, and that dinner, I sitting and I said, tell me you're not doing heroin. And, and she said, oh, who would care? She said, who would care? Yeah. I did care. Yeah, a lot of people did. And, and for me, she set me free to, to a great extent. And I think I, I calmed her down to a great extent because she stopped doing heroin for me. And, you know, that was a, that was a big thing for her. Uh, and I understood why she did it, because she was so, I said in the movie, I think, she was so uh, into people's feelings, and a lot of people are unhappy, and she was able to uh, help them, she thought, anyway. But I loved her dearly. I was hoping to meet her in uh, Kathmandu, and the fact that I was 24 hours late with the letter at the hotel. <laughs> it's really too bad. She was going to meet me in Kathmandu, and uh, I thought if I could get her to the Himalayas, which is a magical place, that maybe you know she could forget those drugs. Because to me, I knew that you know she was bigger than that, and she was a great woman. That's all I can say. I, was, I arrived in uh, Kabul, Afghanistan. I rode a motorcycle across to Africa from Morocco when she sang that song, Little Girl Blue. I mean, uh, Cry Baby. And I rode a motorcycle across Africa and through the Middle East when you still could, in Iran and Iraq. And I got to Afghanistan in Kabul and I pulled the bike over near the only hotel that existed then. There was just dirt everywhere and there was one rock. and. They had this little stand where they had the magazines, and I saw that there was a Time magazine, so I grabbed it and it said that Janice had died. And I sit down, sat down on this rock in the middle of Kabul, the only rock in the middle of Kabul, and I cried. You know, I don't cry much, uh, maybe twice in my three times in my life, but I, I cried because I knew we lost something that was we could never be replaced. She inspired a lot of women, and you know, the, the women of the world need it because uh, we've, you know, they're suppressed somewhat. And it was a great thing to see one who could break free and bring a lot of girls with her. I mean, I actually met with the estate in 2007. That's how long I've been on this project. And one of the first things that I read were letters between Janice and David and it fully inspired me to make the film. It just kind of broke my heart. And actually the telegram was already there. She just didn't receive it. And that, you know, was always that kind of tragic question of what if, you know, she received it that night and she hadn't been lonely. Um, but then he hadn't really been present in her history in the, in the books or anything. So I, it took me a while to find you. Uh, luckily I was working on West of Memphis 
when I finally found David and I had a Nexus account, which is like a kind of a super spy yeah. you know, software where you can kind of find people anywhere. And I remember finding David in Hawaii and he just didn't really know that much about all what had happened since she died. You didn't know about all the books or all the history. Um, and we started talking and the, his, the history of this film, which, you know, trying to make a film over the period of eight years and not having everything. I didn't have all the rights and I didn't have the money and I, there were a lot of issues that came up. So there was this kind of issue of people getting tired of waiting or whatever, but David was so sweet. And, you know, it was always kind of like, well, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to get this together still. And, you know, we eventually got to meet and shoot and everything, but it was always, you know, it was, it was a centerpiece for me of the story, as was this amazing gentleman to my right. So I feel like such an honor to be in New York and have, you know, such strong friends and partners for Janice on the stage tonight. So thank you all. On the way home from Kabul, I took another eight months to get home. And when I got to uh, Hong Kong, her new album was out. and. Uh, it was only records then, there were no tapes even, the way I remember it. And I said to the guy at the record store in Hong Kong, I said, can you put this, uh, put this album on? And he lifted the needle and put it in the record there somewhere, and it said, the first words out in the record were, if you really want me, baby, all you can do is cry. And, you know, that was literally the first words I heard out of that album, and I just went, oh my God. It was, it was, you know, she's a great girl. Maybe it wasn't the best of times, but it was for her because she quit that stupid ass drug. And we, uh, we had a great relationship, you know. She'd iron my clothes, she'd sing me the blues. We, you know, I mean, she did stuff that normal girls do, but I saw one thing in that movie that really was like her. Sometimes she was like a little girl. I mean, a little girl, like 12 years old. And then one night we're sound asleep in Marin County and we hear all this noise in the living room. And she goes, honey, go see what that is. And I go out there and there's five Hell's Angels in the living room. Two of them have guns in their belt. And they got all the fridge open and all the food out and the dish. And I go back in and she said, get rid of those boys, honey. I said, hey, babe, I don't know. <laughs> These guys got guns, there's five of them. I'm, you know, I'm sort of skinny right now, you know. And this is a true story. And she went out there and told each one of them, called them by name, she, because of the concerts, I guess. And she told each one of them where they were at, so to speak. It's incorrect English, but where, where they were. And they left. And I thought, God, thank God I didn't have to try to do that. <laughs> and an hour and a half later, they came back. They had a station wagon. They weren't on their bikes. It was the middle of the night. They came back, and they brought 10 bags of groceries, filled up the refrigerator like it new, and they cleaned the house. <laughs> they wiped the counters down, and they left. I, so she had the power, and sometimes she was a little girl, and sometimes she was a giant. After the show, she was on my show, we went to Elaine's, because she had never been to Elaine's, and twice, in its history, apparently, you know, everybody in the world, every celebrity I've ever heard of from the world was in Elaine's at some point, and it never had any effect on anybody. When Janice went in, it stopped. It's said to have done that only one other time when Mick Jagger walked into Elaine's. Anyway, it stopped. Then it started again, and we sat at a table for two. And I guess, was there a jukebox? There must have been, because as we began to talk, uh, one of her songs suddenly was coming over the speaker system or the jukebox, whatever. And I said, what's the name of that? And she said, Down On Me. And I said, wow, I guess that's one you can't sing on television. <laughs> and she said, it's a gospel. <laughs> I do like you can explain it to me later. <laughs> I might be embarrassed. Uh, anyway, uh, at one point we were hitchhiking north from Rio because Carnival that year, there was some type of terrorism, not like we know it today, but a different type. And they weren't allowing anybody to wear masks at Carnival. And that's like, you know, that changes the whole vibe. So we hitchhiked up to Salvador, like she said, the pictures from Salvador. And we're walking in, we, get, we we're in a, a, a truck and he stops outside of town a ways. This is like a jungle town. And 
we get out of the truck and she's got one of those little pink Mickey uh, Minnie Mouse suitcases, little plastic suitcase, right? And it drops down three feet from the truck and it bursts open and there's her bra and panties in about $20,000 in $100 bills. I went, Jesus, Janice, what is going on? It is before they had credit cards, of course. And she goes, honey, we might see something we want to buy. And we're in the jungle. I mean, you have 20,000 bucks in the jungle. You can buy the jungle. But anyway, we're walking. The reason to give you that, that color was because we're walking into the village through the jungle, and we can hear some music uh, lifting through the jungle. And it ends up being cheap speakers on the bus station on the outside of town, which is the first way we're approaching the town. And they play one of her songs. And it was amazing to be in the jungle with this girl so far from, you know, from this. And to hear her song wafting through the, the jungle trees, it was pretty amazing. Well, the letters are always the centerpiece for me. Um, because I wanted Janice to tell her own story, obviously. Uh, and I, well, there were some legal issues with how I had to portray the letters because there are, there are biopics that are contractually out, out there and you can't do like reenactments, which I didn't really want to do anyway, so I was just looking for the exactly perfect voice for Janice. And um, I heard Cat Power, Sean Marshall, I heard her speaking and I, I just knew immediately and it was such a non-Hollywood moment because I literally like, Googled like Sean Marshall representative and I got this guy named Warren Siegel, who's her film projects manager, which means you don't have to go through like WME or CAA or anything. And he took my call immediately, and two days later she was making voice memos for me. And it was amazing because she had it, you know, she understood Janice. She really, really understood Janice. She's from the South. She's had a lot of the same issues. And she just had that vulnerable presentation that when I played the film for Big Brother and Holding Company a couple months ago, they told me that they forgot it wasn't Janice when they were watching the movie, and I was like, I knew immediately, obviously, that I made the right choice, but she's just perfect, and she's like, she really got it, so. What about you? Did you think it sounded like her? Did I think what? Did it sound like Janice reading the letters? Yeah, it, absolutely, and she was so smart, and she was so literate, and, and really did love Edith Wharton. Um, and was, was it Edith Wharton in particular, or was that one of many authors? Oh, she'd read a lot of good stuff. Yeah, she was a real reader. Um, and outside her school, I think, it was in her real life that she did that. But I, I, I will now give you, I hate the word share. I will give you all of this, and I won't share it. Um, Wait, did you quote, actually have an affair with Janis Joplin? I'm in the middle of a story. Strong for my third time, you know. There is such a thing as manners. <laughs> I was I was told that by a British snippy host, and I said, "Not where I come from." <laughs> Does anyone remember what I was saying? Oh, before I was so tantalizingly interrupted. Oh, this was it. It was the second show Janice came on. And she had just been at a concert somewhere. And I said, was it, she told me the town. And I said, was it a great place to work? I mean, was it a good auditorium? And she said, no. They had numbered seats. How can you groove from G5? <laughs> uh, what was your question again? People have said What's the capital of North Dakota? Kind of intimate relationship with Janice Shop. Everyone wants to know, Dick. Well, I, I, I don't think people like to hear things like that, uh, especially a New York crowd. <laughs> and I've gotten so much mileage out of people who's not knowing that I think, as Gore Vidal said at a show of mine once, I shall draw the curtain of integrity across past it and uh, but uh, anyone yes. want, if you want to know individually, I'll tell you afterwards. I think that's the cue that we should uh, uh, exit the lobby so everyone can get lined up. Thank you. Yeah, we could. Anyone on a higher note.